This video is brought to you by Magic Spoon. I, um, I don't know why I watch this. Why do I do this to myself? Why do I take myself to the theater to watch this garbage? Actually, it's much worse than that. I brought friends with me this time. I had three friends who I'm like, hey, you, you ask me about my work. You, you want to join me for a movie? Do you want to come join me and watch Paws of Fury? Hank's story? Hank's tale? Hank Hill? I don't know. I think it was called Blazing Samurai. It was actually, I know for certain, unfortunately. But yes, a misery loves company. And I brought my friends to go watch this very bizarre film with me. And I'm gonna tell you more about it, all right? So first off, this movie has been in production hell for like close to a decade now. It's kind of a miracle it even came out on the big screen to begin with. And kind of a miscalculation to do so around the same time as Rise of Gru. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, Pauls of Fury is tanking in the box office. Who would have guessed? It would have made more sense to put it in a streaming service, like let Netflix get this one or, or Amazon or something else. I think streaming would have made it out to more viewers, but hey, what do I know? Again, the fact that this film was ever completed at all is a miracle. Here, let me tell you why. Are y'all familiar with Blazing Saddles? It's like the Mel Brooks movie from back in the day with like Gene Wilder and you got like this racist cowboy town where there's a black sheriff who's like put in charge on purpose in order to get the town to like lose their mind, cause issues, get them to get up and leave. There's some guy who wants to like own the territory, buy the land, but the land won't be sold by the village folks because like they won't leave. So it's like, I gotta get them off my land. I gotta, I gotta buy this land for like a train track to go through it. And, and then you follow the comedic adventures that has to do with this black sheriff and, and Gene Wilder, Willy Wonka's there and all the shenanigans between them dealing with the uh, opponents that are sent to go fight them from this like governor or whatever. I, I, I gotta give credit, at least Blazing Samurai, AKA Paws of Fury, it did something good for me. It encouraged me to go watch Blazing Saddles, which is a good film. I mean, it's aged in some ways, but like overall I'm like, okay, that's pretty funny. Why the hell did you base an animated movie off of this? Like, I don't get it. Uh, kind of an odd source, you know? To be like, oh yeah, that's, that th this movie's based on that movie, you know, cut from the same cloth, verbatim, no. So Blazing Samurai, which is, I'm, I'm, I think it's a much more fun title to say Blazing Samurai, but I guess it goes to show you that like, like Hollywood's like, we, no one's gonna know what Blazing Saddles is. Zoomers and millennials won't even know. Change it, Paws of Fury, okay. Instead of like having white people hate this black guy, what if it's a, a cat village in like Japan, I think, or China? I think it is Japan because samurai are from Japan. It's Japan. And there's a sumo wrestler. It is Japan. They don't say that in the movie, but I can I can connect the dots. The cats are like, we don't want to leave. We have to keep dealing with like these uh, these guys raiding our village. We need a new samurai because our old samurai left. Uh, Ricky Gervais' cat who like wants to get rid of the town as well because it's like an eyesore, whatever. It's the same plot as Blazing Saddles. He's like, well, I'll send this dog that we captured, this dog who's voiced by Michael Cera, who, who wants to be a samurai. We'll send him as a samurai to go protect the town of, of with the cats who are going to hate him and the cats will attack the dog and I'll have like, I guess, just cause to like get rid of them off my land. It's like, uh, there's some reaching here as far as like, what the hell are you trying to do? Just get rid of them. Because at the end of the film, it's like, we'll just hire an army to go get rid of them. And I know for like Blazing Saddles, it's a lot more forgiving because it's like, it's Mel Brooks. It's it's supposed to be silly and all over the place and nonsensical. And, and of course, like a lot of fourth wall breaking, like big time in Blazing Saddles. Here for Pauls of Fury, I'm like, what uh, is this movie trying to say? What's it trying to do? And I feel like so much of why the film's so like at odds with itself is due to its production history. And by the way, like Pan covers this so much more efficiently in his video about Blazing Samurais. Go check that out. But in a nutshell, this idea came from some executive from Sony. Uh, like 10 years ago, he started some company called like Mass Animation, which like crowdsourced the animation for the project. So that, that was like the idea, like you submit your animated scene that you pick out and then we um, don't pay you. Uh, you get paid an exposure. What? That doesn't, uh, that, what, what, whose idea was that? That doesn't make any sense. Like that's, that's your idea for, for a movie to, to make a movie. That's just maybe a short. 
online, maybe, but like not for a full fledged film. And the movie got like shopped around because like you got like Mel Brooks as like a writing credit, get Richard Pryor as a writing like credit because he did the screenplay for uh, Blazing Saddles. So I'm sure there's some like credits that are like, no, you know, that because it's based so much on Blazing Saddles, we have to put their name on Blazing Samurai. So yeah, Richard Pryor worked on Blazing Samurai. And to me, because I feel like I'm all over the place the same way that this movie is in its production, is this is a classic example of someone in Hollywood trying to push a big idea with connections. Oh, we got Mel Brooks on this one, Samuel Jackson, Michael Cera, Gabriel Iglesias. We got uh, all kinds of voice actors attached to this. And also we got Rob Minkoff, who is the director of The Lion King, who's a producer on this film. And we got all kinds of big names attached. And it's like hot potato of like, don't want it don't want it. Somebody want it. I don't know. Who's in charge? I don't know. They just left. It's like, wow, disaster. No leadership, no vision, and probably a big lack of funding. So I see this as one of those moments where Hollywood has an idea and it's like, we got some big names who already provided their voice acting lines for this. And it's like, can we finish the movie? Can we peddle this? Can we sell it? And it's like maybe seven years ago, but like in 2022 in theaters? No, not really. And here's the thing that gets me the most is like, there's actually an idea here. I watched the movie with like, like super low ex expectations. I thought I was, I was gonna hate it. I did not. I didn't think it was good. It was just like below average. I'm like, this could have been a great, like just put it up on a Netflix streaming for like the week. You know, that, that could have been fine. Like better than Marmaduke, that's for damn sure. And the entire like idea of like a village of cats hitting a dog who's like been sent there to be a samurai. I didn't think that, that could work. Oddly enough, despite being inspired and paying homage and based on Blazing Saddles, the concept for Blazing Samurai could have worked. And it's so sad because you have all these names and talent attached to this project and like they couldn't connect the dots. It just it couldn't coalesce at the end. It fell apart. So I feel like at the end, uh, when it comes to the production of this thing, like being released and actually like completed, it's like you're seeing kind of an incomplete corpse on screen where you're like, okay, it's it's not bad. The character designs, the animation, the the story, the jokes, the voice acting. It's like okay, there are folks who had their fingers in the pie on this project who knew what they were doing, but nobody wanted to keep their fingers in the pie for too long and left. When I was doing my research for this film, because like I was looking, I'm like, okay, producers, directors, voice actors, like what, what's the weak chain here? It was writers. You got some guy named Ed Stone and Nate Hopper who are like the writers of this film, and they don't really have anything in the way of like massive credits for like previous experiences with their resume or film. Filmography. And I'm like, could that have been the problem? Just bad writing, a bad screenplay? I don't know. I don't know. Because at this point, I could like really go into it with like the characters, the themes, and everything. But I'm like, what's the point? It's kind of simple, surface level stuff. And again, it's another shame because Samuel L. Jackson, he's a great actor. He never phones it in. And Michael Sarah is the voice of this dog, Hank, who's like, I want to be a samurai. I want. I don't care. Like if the cats won't teach me, I will teach myself. And like Samuel L. Jackson being like this samurai cat in disgrace is like, I'll teach you. Fine. Kind of the same way of like Gene Wilder and like Blazing Saddles. Kind Kind of, kind of. They take some liberties here and there, but it's like, this could have been an idea. The idea of this dog, like, I can't be a cat, but I can be a dog. And it's like, okay, where are dogs from? Uh, in the movie, they're like, dogs are from a city, like an actual modern city with like the Wolverine snapping their fingers as they do a little like gangster dance. And then it's like, what, what is this world? It's all over the place. And also like, as far as the jokes go, the pacing, it's like rapid fire where it's like, what the hell is happening? These jokes just keep coming at me nonstop. Some of them are funny. And you got like Mel Brooks, who's like in the movie, who's like, I'm, I'm Mel Brooks. And yeah, I made a movie once and, uh, and the world, wide, wide world of sports. And it's like, I'm sure my grandfather, who's, you know, 90 will enjoy that reference, you know? <laughs> Kids won't get it, but I'm sure that my grandfather will. Overall, I'm here to bitch about my experience, to say that it's not a good movie, it's not as bad as I thought it would be, but it's not good. And it goes to show you that you can throw money into a project and have all the big names attached to it and, and have all the networking, but if you don't have someone at the helm who knows what they're doing to bring it all together, it'll fall apart. It will. Like, yeah, I, I see effort here and I see quality, but it lacks any heart. And it felt like it was like an idea that someone's like, hey, maybe we can make this into a thing. And then it fell apart. And I'm surprised it's been on live support for years and it made it to the big screen. I mean, that's kind of insane, but uh, definitely a letdown in the grand scheme of where it started and what it could have been if it had proper people at the helm. 
I have to ask you guys, the folks who watch this film, who are watching this video, what the hell did you think of it? I'm sincerely curious. I, tell me in the comments, because like I feel like bewildered. My brain's fried. Where it's like I can't even like really string words together to accurately describe my disappointment in this film. But at the same time, it's just I'm stunned that it even came out at all. So let me know what you all think in the comments, and I'll see you all next time. So a big shout out to this video sponsor, Magic Spoon. Guys, I love cereal. There's just something so universal about it. So when I started keto, I felt this sharp pain in my soul knowing that cereal and I would have to break up. I'm sorry, baby. It's just me. Unless, boom, magic spoon. Cereal reinvented. Frosted, fruity, peanut butter, cocoa, cookies and cream. Guys, these aren't just my stripper nicknames, but also the flavors offered by Magic Spoon and their cereal. Cereal that has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four to five net grams of carbs in each serving. Except for Honey Nut, who is rocking one gram of sugar. And all of these flavors are only 140 calories per serving. I had like 10 boxes of Magic Spoon last year that I destroyed in like two weeks. My keto ass was over the moon to have cereal again. Protein cereal. Oh, and Magic Spoon now offers cereal bars. That was a pleasant surprise. And they too channel the same nutritional energy. One gram of sugar, 10 grams of protein, four net grams of carbs, and only 130 calories per bar. Also, all of this is gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and keto-friendly. I personally, I'm a sucker for the peanut butter flavor, but the new cinnamon roll flavor might take that spot. It is legit tasty. Oh, cinnamon, how I've missed you. So click the link down below to get some Magic Spoon cereal today. You can build your very own variety box and use my code SABERSPARK for $5 off. You can choose from the best-selling cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, cookies and cream, and maple waffle flavors. Plus other awesome flavors, including honey nut, blueberry muffin, and cinnamon roll. You can also add the cookies and cream and cocoa peanut butter flavor cereal bars to your variety box. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it is backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link down below and use the code SABERSPARK for $5 off. Or go to magicspoon.com slash SABERSPARK to save $5 off your order today. Also, for my Canadian and British viewers, Magic Spoon is now shipping to Canada and the UK. Go hit them up today.